I mean, I was in hospital and I saw eight people die in my ward, and that really just changed my perspective of my life. I just posted that up with the song Bob Daddy, hashtag Bob Daddy Challenge. Um, <laughs> um, uh, before I knew it, it, it just became something else. Um, you know, I didn't even expect this. It was never planned. It wasn't like, oh, this was what I intended for it to be. I could not make money. I was losing money day by day. Spending money, no money was coming inside. That was when my aunt came up with a suggestion of if I wanted to run a skincare brand or if I was interested in skincare back then. So I kind of spent the whole of lockdown just in denial, planning my wedding. Like, yeah, this is going to be over by June, July. We're going to go back to normal. And it's like things were just not getting better. When I finally reached Nigeria, like the first thing I did, I hugged my husband for like, <laughs> for like five minutes. I just held on to him. <laughs> so um, I have a long history of working. I started working as far back as um, 1995, up until 2020, when Corona came. I had a steady customer base before lockdown. During lockdown, it evolved to a lot of random people that I didn't know, but it increased generally. And that increase just became, which one is, is it geometric or arithmetic? Maybe like an arithmetic progression. Geometric is a jump, so an arithmetic progression. So it just steadily increased since lockdown over the course of then till this particular moment. So positively, I, I believe that um, COVID allowed me to, you know, reflect on, uh, on some of the skills that I've been hiding a lot. And um, public speaking became my thing. I started public advocacy on social media, you know, and I became, you know, a little bit more um, known for that. Life has really changed because of COVID. It's like the world has now been divided into two parts. It's almost like biblical times we had the AD and the BC. Uh, so maybe we'll say before COVID will be BC. January of 2020, I was at home. Um, I usually work, but I was at home on a medical leave because I had a, a quite severe leg injury. I was also pregnant at the time, so it was very, it was a very dramatic time. I had a lot that was personally going on, so I didn't really care about what was happening in the world. And um, so until I had to think about um, my plans for travel, what will I need, how will I need it, and thinking about being at the airport, that's when I started thinking, uh, paying attention to the news. My life before COVID was just like everybody else. Um, okay, I, I stayed at home a lot, so the lockdown didn't really shake me. I work from home most of the time. If I'm not on set, I'm at home. When I first heard about coronavirus as a thing, I was in the UK, actually. I was in London. Um, this was February 2020. January, February, uh, January, February, January slash February 2020. I was in London. Um, I had literally just released a song, a song called Pop Daddy. And um, I was in London, because uh, uh, the song features Miss Banks. So we had to shoot a video in London. And you know, also just try to make some moves out there. And um, so while I was there, there was this whole craze about this new virus. COVID-19, it's come, it's taking over the world, everybody's getting infected, people are dying, it's, it's going crazy, what's going on, the, the, the world is about to go into a lockdown. So at the time, I actually thought I was going to be stuck in London. So my mind, I was like, ah, this is not my country, I know, you cannot close the border and I'm still here. So they made an announcement saying the last flight coming from London to Nigeria is on Sussu Day, so everybody had to like scramble, make sure we got on that flight and, you know, come back to, uh, to Nigeria. There's a difference between knowing you can go out, right? And choosing not to go out. And wanting to escape the house and not being able to because the, the world is on lockdown. So the choice to go out was taken away from me, which was annoying because on a good day, I don't go out. so. When I want to go out, please allow me. Um, but it was it was fun because the entire time 
it, it's like the whole world picked up new hobbies. So I went with the flow, the banana bread chaos, the banana bread season. We did it. Um, my mom got into YouTube, so that was new. So I was watching a lot of YouTube. Um, it was I was working the entire time, so it didn't really, in a way, it didn't really feel like something different was happening apart from the fact that the world was on fire and everybody was panicking but it was okay there was food there was netflix it was it was okay covid has really changed a lot about the world traveling how we walk how we interact how we commune how we commute you know covid has changed the way it, it's, it's the new norm, like things have changed. You can't do things that you would normally do uh, five, seven, six years ago. You can't host parties and have like lots of people because you're afraid that somebody might have COVID and you know, it, it's a life threatening thing and you may die, you may not die. Um, but we have, this is what, this is the new reality is what we have to live with. Um, it's difficult, but at least we're alive, that's what's important. The, uh, before COVID, like anything else, um, the medical system has always had its challenges. And if we are being honest, um, where there, there has always been the very low confidence in you know, the healthcare system in Nigeria pre-COVID. Uh, so bad that many of our leaders don't even tend to get medical care in the country. They, they actually fly outside the country. And um, by the time uh, pre we, that was, this was pre-COVID, but when COVID happened, everybody had no other option but to stay in the country and enjoy the health care that they built or they did not build. You don't know the clients you're going to meet, if the person has COVID, or even you, you know, passing it from one client to another. And then also, like, in terms of making money, we had less clients to work with. But now that things are getting back to normal, it's been picking up. But in 20, 2020, it was, it was a mess, I won't lie. I had, say, a certain average that I would cook every week before lockdown. Business was a little wonky, but then such is life, you know. So we have the great weeks, we have the not so great weeks. Then during lockdown, like I said before, there was like one week, two weeks of not doing anything at all. And then once I started operations back, it was just boom. There was quite an explosion. I believe that um, COVID allowed me to, you know, reflect on uh, on some of the skills that I've been hiding a lot. And um, public speaking became my thing. I started public advocacy on social media, you know, and I became, you know, a little bit more um, known for that. And that really helped me to build my skills, you know, uh, staying behind the camera, talking comfortably. These were things that I never knew how to do in the past. Or I didn't, I was passionate about it, but I really didn't know how to do that in the past. But I think COVID made me a more creative person. So I would take that as maybe a win. And um, uh, for me, I feel that COVID inf impacted me positively as well as the negative parts, but then I was able to find strength and uh, make the best out of it. They say when they give you lemons, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. So I think um, COVID-19 was my lemonade and we've been sipping it nice. Netflix and chill now. Yeah, especially during lockdown, I mean, you can't really go anywhere. Yeah. And you know when they even started like easing restrictions, we still had maybe six o'clock was the curfew or then they moved it to eight. So there wasn't really much we could do. So we watched a lot of shows at home and just, yeah, Netflix and chill basically. <laughs> oh yeah, and at some point we downloaded um, Wordscapes, some word oh, game. Oh my God, this game on, it's from the iTunes store, it's called Wordscapes. We were obsessed with that game, like literally two for seven during lockdown playing it. Yeah. So we spent most yeah, whole of lockdown together. So would you say it has brought you both closer? In terms of bringing us closer, I think before the pandemic, okay, so let's say before the pandemic, we were spending four out of seven days together. And then the pandemic was seven out of seven. So I won't say it was like a drastic change because we're already mostly together all the time anyway. But I mean, before, if I was tired of Kuiz or Hala, I can go home. <laughs> but 
with the pandemic, we we're basically quarantining together. So yeah, not yeah. going anywhere. The best you can do is go to the living room or go to the room. <laughs> yeah, I think the pandemic, lockdown, whatever, whatever, it has kind of made us grow together probably faster than, and I, I even mean this even marriage-wise now, than I guess would have been normal before because we have literally been in each other's faces <laughs> since February 2020. Yeah. Daily, just in each other's faces, right? Um, yeah, so there's no escape. So, really and truly, if things were going to scatter, <laughs> they, scattered they could and would have scattered <laughs> in that period, but it's been nice. It's been yeah. sweet. What am I going to do? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you also be um, a bit afraid that, you know, spending that much time together might unearth. Yeah, you are afraid. Ah, uh, it's human, it's, it's human <laughs> feeling. You, ne you just really never know. Fair. Um, yeah, so I think that, that would have been the biggest fear for me, but here we are today. Here we are. Mm -hmm. One year later. <laughs> Don't like this shirt you wore. Did you try and compliment my shirt? Of course not. Are you sure? Yes. You can you can it's, be honest. I'm too. wearing it to match my trousers. You should probably can't see in this video. But, but I wore you saw this before you wore anything you, you wore. Wait, you don't disturb me. What I wanted to wear, he told me I can't wear stripes. That is going to affect everything. So here we are. <laughs> so um I have a long history of working. I started working as far back as um, 1995 in Abuja in a construction company called Cetraco. I'd worked there for 19 years before resigning and then going back to school in the States. And when I came back and joined the oil, oil industry, it was a change. It, um, it was something that, you know, because the oil industry, as you know, in Nigeria is supposed to be uh, the place to be because of the money and everything that you get. But also there's a challenge of traveling. There's a challenge of working. And, you have to be in the office early in the morning. The HR was always there expecting that you must be there. And at the closing time, you sign out, you know? So by the time Corona came and we were all asked to go home, it was surprising that this lady who would not want us to miss office one day was actually the person saying, everybody go out and stay at home. So for me, it, it was joy. I wanted things to be fast because at that same time, I couldn't make money because I was actually into ushering jobs. And mostly, most events were done online back then. So I could not make money. I was losing money day by day. Spending money, no money was coming inside. I could not make money. I was losing That was when my aunt came up with a suggestion of if I wanted to run a skincare brand or if I was interested in skincare back then. I started doing practicals, started working. So I, made, I think I posted a picture that was June. And my friends were like, uh, and what happened to your face? Your face is now clear. Your face is clean. I was like, ah, um, I use something now. And she's like, I should tell her. I was like, oh, um, I made it. And she's like, oh, do you sell? And that's when this idea of, okay, oh, business has come for me. I'll start making dollars. Oh, Naira. It took me a while, first of all, to you know, get back to work because some of my clients, you know, were not going out. You know, we had like events because I was always working with like, um, artists, you know, actors and stuff like that. So some of them, they were not having like events proper to go out. So the bookings kind of reduced. So I had to now sit back and like we, we um, strategize on how to go about, you know, still making money. Looking for a means to kill boredom. Since I wasn't working, I wasn't doing the thing I love making, like glamming people up. And I got tired of always doing it on my face because that was how it started. I was like, okay, let me look for a platform to kind of express myself. So I found TikTok and I'm like, okay, let me use this app to just while you wait time, jump on like some challenges, trends, and then from there, use that to also, you know, make tutorials, you know, to show off my makeup skills. And then from there, it just like blew up and now it's, it's, it's crazy because now I get like messages from like artists wanting me to promote their song on my page and get paid for it just by, you know, one phone and one tripod. <laughs> but it's been amazing, I won't lie. In terms of activism, you know, I wouldn't say there was anything fresh um, from my part. 
um, about 2020 because activism is a thing that has always been embedded in me, embedded in me in my in my career, in my music, in my in everything, in my commentary, in everything that I do. You know, so uh, it wasn't a new thing. But 2020 was remarkable in the sense of uh, the events that transpired and everything that happened. Coming straight out the lockdown, I think everyone was just realizing, you know, just how much hardship had, you know, had had appeared, you know. Um, people didn't really, even before the lockdown, people were already, you know, in horrible conditions, but, you know, that just kind of made things 10 times worse because a lot of people weren't working, you know, nowhere to earn from. And, you know, so coming out the lockdown, I think there was a lot of built up annoyance and, you know, anger. Um, and there was so much going on all around the world as well. At the same time, the Black Lives Matter here. I think, it's, uh, 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 was it Sierra Leone or Congo, uh, Uganda? There were, there were so many issues all around the world happening around that period. And, you know, here, it was uh, these constant violations of uh, human rights by these men that were supposed uh, to be protecting us. And, you know, that was what birthed the entire NSARS movement. And um, it, it was quite a, a, a remarkable movement. Um, ended in very, very uh, terribly heartbreaking uh, circumstances. Um, but the, the spirit, the energy that we were able to muster, what we were able to, to build that period, I think is, not, is something that this country has never ever seen before. Yeah. So the biggest challenge with working with tons of people since COVID is that, uh, and I'll say this as a filmmaker, there are certain things, stories or patterns that you'd like to work and you'd have to adjust. So for instance, um, I love doing epic films and one of the biggest tropes in, you know, when you're writing or doing, you know, epic things is um, at some point you're going to write a, a village square or you're going to write a... Uh, king addressing certain people, or you're going to write a war scene, or you're going to write something, or in some cases a musical. You can't have as much people as you can in those scenes because you have to worry about the logistics of having those kinds of people around, and especially um, not just logistics, but also medical, the medical history. It's challenging, but as I said, we now have to find a way to adjust. I'll give one last example. I remember when, when we were um, trying to even just think, uh, when we we're about to do one of our TV shows and we we're just thinking of, you know, how do we even just accommodate people? Usually, I mean, you're like, you know, three people in a room, everybody's going to be fine. But you can't do that now. So you're thinking, okay, maybe, I mean, we didn't do what I'm saying we're doing, but I mean, you're thinking, okay, let's do two or one person. But that two or one person comes at a cost. The question is, oh, does your budget, can your budget accommodate for that cost? Or can your budget, Jonathan? So it's now very difficult. So now we have to start thinking about more money um, when we're planning these things because you have to follow COVID protocols. You have to make sure that when people come, like one of the things we did was when people are coming to set, you have to come and stop at some point. You have to wash your hands. You have to take temperature check. You have to do all that stuff. And all those eats into the time where you would just normally drive your car, jump into set, and start filming. So the lifestyle has changed and we have to adjust. Is it going to cost us something? Yes. But what's more important? Your health. So it's a bit challenging for us, but again, it's us adjusting. Uh, I've been in charge of a, you know, a private health institution here in Lagos, and um, it wasn't easy because um, personally from the business side of things, pa patients were very afraid to come to the hospital. So many of them ended up just panicking and not coming. And definitely that affected revenue because you can't attend, you are not seeing patients and there are staff to pay and the staff have mouths to feed. In fact, at some point, for some months, uh, all the staff agreed to go on half salary. And it was difficult, but I think that was about two months or so or three before things seemingly began to come back. It was a very hard time. People were afraid going to hospitals. They didn't know if they were going to meet with COVID patients. And, you know, nobody was really sure what was going on. 
and um, there was all this confusion and uh, there was there, there was the need for people like me to put word out there for people to know that look there is no need to panic that because I, there was a there was an era where chloroquine was trending and it was trending so bad that so many people we now started having people coming into the hospital with chlor chloroquine overdose and yes chloroquine in you know um, reactions and all of that that was actually what was bringing people to the hospital primarily because of misinformation a lot of people went buying in fact the price of chloroquine went up and so many things like that so uh, one of the few things I tried to do in my own space was to try and put out the right information out there for people to know that, look, there's no need for you to panic. There's no need for you to start looking for chloroquine and packing chloroquine inside your house. The, the only thing you need to do is to uh, ensure that you maintain social distancing, wear a face mask and stay at home as much as you can if need be and don't go to public spaces. So those were the things that actually helped to limit the spread of the disease at... Uh, hmm. How did it affect our choice of wedding? Find, hmm. Over to you. <laughs> you know, I have a lot to say about this. So basically, we got engaged in March, and we were supposed to have the wedding in October. So I kind of spent the whole of lockdown just in denial, planning my wedding. Like, yeah, this is going to be over by June, July. We're going to go back to normal. And it's like things were just not getting better. So for the parents, it was almost like, we don't know when things are going to get better, and you can't just stay engaged in perpetuity. So... And you, can't live have, in sin. and you cannot live in sin. So we're going to do what we need to do so that you guys are married. And then if things get better, you can have your wedding later. So we ended up just having, it was about, I think in the whole living room, we were about maybe 30. So it was like just the very important family heads and co from each side, two imams and yeah, and they married us. To the day before the wedding, I still couldn't believe it was happening. <laughs> Grooves. Rocks. If there was no lockdown, we'd have had there rocks. No we'd have had a yeah. crowd. Seriously. Because I mean, I have a big family. Koei has a big family. So there were a lot of people that we both would have wanted to be there. But And I have a lot of friends. A lot. A yeah. lot. So <laughs> it would have been a big, um, big soiree. Yeah. So would you still want to have a big wedding? Oh man, lockdown has finished. I'm having my wedding. <laughs> I'm having my wedding. Oh. And like for me, like my siblings don't live in Nigeria and so they couldn't even make, okay, well, one of them could make the um, Nikai because he was in Nigeria. But I feel like for a wedding, it's just that feeling of having all your loved ones around and cool. So yeah, I'm having my wedding. 1000%. <laughs> um, how did you how did you approach the I mean, everybody, when we said we were having a, like, 30 people wedding, everybody kind of understood, well, most people understood this is what's going on now. And a lot of people had already been getting married with really small weddings, so we were not the first, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, a lot, most people understood, but you still have some that caught feelings, or oh, you didn't invite me, I can't believe you had 30 people there, and I wasn't one of the 30, so yeah, you still have that. Yeah. But most people were understanding. And you also had people saying, you people just, you people shall know this is not the real one, shall we? I'm still going to do the main one. <laughs> just reminding you, in case you've forgotten, or in case you think that this is your easy way out, nah. And anytime you bump into them, they keep reminding you, <laughs> ah, we haven't done, oh, people have not. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> so funny thing is that we got married uh, November 23rd, 2019 and after like three four months uh, we're into lockdown and it was really really it was fun and at the same time it was crazy because all the outing that we planned to do after marriage we couldn't do that so it was it was just yeah. us at home seeing each other every day getting tired like the routine it just became like a routine of waking up trying to find things to entertain ourselves in the house, and then going back to sleep. We literally saw every movie <laughs> on Netflix. It was just crazy. Uh, at one point, we even took our bed. Yes, we took our mattress from our bedroom to the parlor, because obviously we're not going to have visitors. So it was in the parlor that we would just like wake up, you know, go and have our bath in our bedroom, come back again on that, like, you know, it was crazy. 
was we're, fun. We're, it was fun. Yeah, we're what? just we're just sleeping and waking. Eat, Eating. sleep, wake, sleep, wake. Then sometimes create content yeah. because she she got. I found TikTok. She got, <laughs> and at some point, she dragged me into creating content with her. And it was actually fun because there was a lot of content where I was just jumping in front of the camera. Savage challenge. <laughs> <laughs> From a management standpoint, I'd say that it's been a little difficult. It hasn't been a walk in the park because the pandemic brought about awareness about laxities that we didn't know we had. So while I try my possible best to maintain a very high standard of hygiene, personally and in my workspace, different people with different backgrounds have different standards. So I have to constantly, it's not just a one-off thing, I have to constantly educate, re-educate, remind them that, you know what, there's a pandemic. While I know that we are quite, you know, back to the regularity of our lives is still there. So we can't be lax about it. So from a management point, managing people, that has been that. And then running the business itself, I feel like the, the finances changed because the inflation was cutthroat. It still is cutthroat because nothing is coming down. While there has been, you know, an increase in sales, finances have been a little challenging because I've had to increase prices due to the inflation. And we know that the general economy was already heading towards a certain direction, but then COVID came and accelerated things. Man, not being able to do shows during the lockdown, I think it was uh, probably one of the worst things about the lockdown. Um, performing is such a big part of the art of being a just being a, uh, a a musician, you know that that is that is a huge huge part. Um, if, not even in terms of income, just in terms of the art as a whole, you know, just it's such a vital aspect being snatched away so suddenly as well. I think it was probably one of the worst things um, about 2020. I went for an operation in 2020 around um, May. I had a pain in my side and it turned out to be appendix. And I had to go to the hospital. I went to the hospital with my daughter at night and St. Nicholas, they said nobody should stay with me. She had to go back home and I had to have an operation in two days. So staying in the hospital alone and discussing with the nurses and doctors there, it was obvious something was really happening you know, because there was fear. And uh, the funny thing was, the first day I got into the hospital, I had actually gone to St. Nicholas in Lagos Island. I don't know if it's true, but it seems like that was where one of the top shots from Abuja actually died. And apparently he died of COVID there. So he died in the night and I got there in the morning and the chief medical director was upstairs, who I knew personally. And as he saw me coming towards the hotel, he started screaming, Kola, what are you doing here? Go back. And I was holding my side, trying to tell him that, no, I have pain. <laughs> it wasn't easy. He said, I should go back. And then at the gate, they now told me, oh, God, you have to go, that somebody died here of corona, that they have to sanitize the whole hospital. But I had a pain that I could not bear. And they now sent me to the Victoria Island branch, where they said they couldn't do anything. I should go back to the Maryland. All this while, my mind was just going bonkers because they are telling me there's corona, but there's pain that is more physical, unlike the corona, which I don't see and I don't know. So I got to the hospital, they admitted me, and eventually they did the operation. But that fear of that corona was already there now. Because an hospital that you normally go to and you see people all the time, now it was empty. The people that were there, didn't want to come close to you. They were always wearing masks. And you can imagine going through an operation and nobody comes to say hello to you in the hospital. You're alone. The nurses and the doctors will just come in, see you, and then go. So at that period, I started believing that there was actually something called coronavirus out there. 
I, I, I eventually, you know, fell into that group of people that actually belong to the fact that there was coronavirus out there. I haven't, um, I haven't had the experience. A lot of my friends have said, oh, they had the, they had the experience of corona, but they are okay. I don't know what the experience is because there are still different, different ways of explaining it. The only thing I know is that when people say you can't breathe, you need oxygen. To me, that's where the problem is. I haven't seen anybody that that has happened to, but I think that is what really makes me worry. That how do you get to a stage where you cannot breathe and you need oxygen? So it's funny. It's one of those great things that we take for granted. Now we're all breathing free air. And then you tell me somebody's restricted, he can't breathe until he buys oxygen. For how much? Wow. So. I'm praying that it never happens to anybody close to me. I traveled with my daughter. My mother was going to join us. Um, we were staying in New York City, in the suburb. It was not, no, it wasn't New York City. It was New York State, I guess, in the suburbs. Um, so we're staying um, with another family, but we're in different apartments, sort of. So during the lockdown, we just, everybody had to just lock yourself in with whatever family you're in. So we had barely an interaction with the family above us. It was just me, my mother, my pregnant self, um, my daughter. I'm, I called myself twice. <laughs> um, so in New York City, New York City was like ground zero of Corona. Um, after a while, they had so many cases um, and then so many deaths. So it was very scary. We, held, we barely went out on the news. There was a lot of information, what they're going to do, how they're going to protect, what they're going to provide. But it was also a lot of information and it was very scary. So if I go out for a walk because I was pregnant, I was about eight months pregnant at the time. And that's in February of 2020. If I go out for a walk, there would be no one on the streets. The whole street was empty. If you saw another person, if you're walking towards each other, one of you would cross the road and you kind of hold your breath because it was that scary. Um, I went for only two of my antenatal uh, visits after that. The first, the second time I went, I was in full panic mode. There were no cars on the streets. The hospitals were almost empty. You couldn't, it was so scary. So um, during the lockdown or right after the lockdown, I don't know if I'm talking too much. Um, in New York, George Floyd was murdered and things went crazy again. So it was Corona and then it was the political situation. And then there was also the fear. People were already dying in thousands. Like the, the lady that lived above me was a nurse. And some days she would just come home and you could see her, she was broken. Like, so it was very real. And then the riots started happening, all the protesting, and I was so scared. I was like, are we not, we're coming to the end of this pandemic. Can we not, you know, super spread it again? I didn't know I had COVID until, you know, what happened happened. Um, and I had to go get tested. And I found out that, oh, there was, they even said, um, there's a status they gave me, it wasn't, you know when you've had COVID and the antibodies in your body? So that was, there was, this was I, I've forgotten what the status was, but it wasn't positive. It wasn't negative. It was, there's a name for it. So you've had COVID and you didn't know kind of COVID. So I had COVID and I thought it was malaria. I, was, um, I had COVID in a period where I was very, very active. I'd just done a food drive. It was December, I'd just done a food drive. So I was really, really exhausted from the food drive. and. I thought, oh, it's just exhaustion. It's just, I'm just tired. We're all just tired. Unfortunately, it was COVID. Um, so, to answer your question, yes. I've had the original, the OG COVID, and the um, variant. So, twice. Yes. Um, it was my auntie that dropped me, that took me to the um, hospital. She didn't want to follow me. So, I was in, I was in, I was basically about to deliver and I was walking myself to the hospital because she was too scared to come out. The fear was palpable in New York. 
We got to the hospital. It was basically empty. It was like ghost stuff. But I was still wearing my face mask, as you must. It wasn't, it wasn't the way it is in Nigeria where it's optional or you think about it. You're wearing your face mask or you, are, you have a political view about face masks. It was, there was no middle ground. Um, I, I gave birth within, or when I reached the hospital, within 15 minutes. I gave birth wearing my face mask. Doctors were all in face mask. And then you'd hear stories. Um, I was in hospital for only a day after I gave birth, which is not typical. But it was because of corona. They just couldn't keep anyone at the hospital. You heard about um, one of the janitors on my floor apparently had died from corona. So it wasn't... It wasn't far-fetched for anybody. It was, everybody was having somebody that had died at that point. Um, my auntie that dropped me at the hospital, she had a friend whose mother died and the mother came to visit. So in New York, it was really, it was really something else. And then I was thinking to myself, because I left my daughter and my mother, I'll catch corona after I've given birth. We'll carry our six selves, and I would kill my. <laughs> I would kill my family. It was so, was so messed up. Honestly, I'm not over it, as you can clearly see. It was, it was two years. My son is going to be two. That is so scary. So yeah, my mom... <laughs> this is weird. Um, so my mom died. Yeah, I lost my mom. It felt like we, we would die for the longest, for like two months. That was all, that was not heard. If we go outside, we would die. And then we got to the grocery store. Honestly, it was so therapeutic. And coming back to Nigeria. <sighs> Honestly, you would not even know <laughs> what was happening. And it felt so good, really. Because it was so scary. It was so scary. I, uh, And we came home, we were just laughing and we we're so happy that, oh my God. When I finally reached Nigeria, like the first thing I did, I hugged my husband for like, <laughs> for like five minutes. I just held on to him. <laughs> God. People are not supposed to see things like that. It was like the end of days. I was asking myself, because, uh, like I said, before I traveled, I broke my leg. And then I broke my leg. There was haze in Lagos. Trump said people shouldn't travel for pets anymore. I was like, this is a sign from God that we shouldn't have gone. So where did I go? This is where we <laughs> Weird reason. I miss the signs. I didn't know it was COVID. Like, and I should have known. Like, she said she was tired. We, my mom was super careful. Um, 
the whole COVID season, she didn't leave the house. Even when the lockdown was lifted, and it was a joke, we were joking about it, how she was so scared. Now they lifted the lockdown and she was like, oh, Lagos is being irresponsible, she's not going anywhere. And even when I went out, at the door she'll be screaming, go have a bath, make sure it's not water. And she'll be running to her room like she's not going to see you until you've had your bath. So, a little time passed and she, I encouraged her to go out. You be careful, you use a mask, you use hand sanitizer. So I had a food drive in December. I do these um, food collation things for communities in December. And the day before we arranged the food, um, the raw food, so we had like stations for rice, beans, curry. The day before we arranged the food, she was, she told me she wasn't, she was tired. So she stayed in bed the whole day and she took malaria medicine because she was, she thought she had malaria. Then the day of the collation of the food stuff, she got out of bed. She helped, she and my friends were j joking, laughing. She was even stealing Cocoa Pops and <laughs> we kept telling her the Cocoa Pops for the children. <laughs> Mommy stopped stealing Cocoa Pops. And we went on a food drive together on the 24th of December, the day before Christmas. We went to the community. She was even gisting. She met an old student, so she was even gisting with them. And then after a while, she told me she felt tired and she wanted to go home. And I told a friend to take her home. I got home that day and she was in bed and I thought, yeah, exhaustion. Everybody's tired. I was tired from the food drive. I went to bed. 25th Christmas Day. She didn't get out of bed. And I was still tired. So I thought, yeah, I've used this woman. Let her sleep. But I was talking to a friend of mine a day and a day was like, she's been saying she's tired. Are you gonna Are you gonna take her to the hospital? And I was like, Mom, should we go to the hospital? She was like, Oh, she's just tired. It's not Nothing like that, she's just tired. 26th, she got out of bed. She was disturbing me, she wanted to eat <laughs> powder yam and seafood okra from yellow chili. It had to be from yellow chili. Yellow chili was closed. And they were like, oh, tomorrow, Sunday. So her two favorite things were powder yam from yellow chili, powder yam and seafood okra, or pizza. So we got pizza. And she had quite a bit, so I thought, oh, she's fine, but we'll still go to the hospital tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so that was 26, 27. I woke up in the morning and it was a Sunday. Usually she streams the service in my room because my TV is bigger. time for the service and she hadn't come to my room <laughs> so I went to check her out <laughs> she was sitting on her bed like she was praying so I went to bug her like it's time for the service that you're not going to Yeah. I was late. <laughs> I was late. She had gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Covid took my mom. <laughs> A 
it was COVID. <laughs> That's how I found out that I had COVID. I didn't even know. So, yeah. I messed up, it was a little careless. It was a little careless. <laughs> I should have known. But I didn't know. <laughs> So she was here one day and gone the next. <laughs> She's gone. It's a very bad experience. So, um, I have had COVID. So I just finished shooting the sitcom. When I was done with the sitcom, I thought I was exhausted. So I had a fever, I had headaches. So I went to the hospital, I thought I was maybe I was just ill or exhausted from work. And um, the doctor the doctor even assumed it was malaria or typhoid. When I found I had COVID, I was I was uh, I was scared to death because I had recently researched about COVID. I had lost so many people from COVID. I lost six friends prior to me having COVID. So, and I was very careful about not getting COVID. I was, I was even paranoid about it. And then when I realized I had COVID, you know, I was, um, I was scared. I think it's mentally messes you up more than physically. Because what was weird was that I was able to, I was strong, I was able to move around and all that, but I couldn't get off oxygen. I was, I had an oxygen mask for a month. It was so bad that if I had to go to the toilet, you had to bring the cylinder, the oxygen cylinder with me because I literally couldn't take it off. I would just pass out or something. It was the most weird, it was the weirdest thing I'd seen in my life because you can't breathe your lungs. My lungs were completely collapsed and I really thought I was going to die. Matter of fact, I called my lawyer and I just told him to, you know, revoke my will because I just felt like that was it. Because seeing people that I assume were in better physical state, physical state than I was, Dying, I was. Uh, it was shocking for me. I was like, "Yo, me with my weight, I'm gone." You know. So it was it was it was mentally very terrible because wake up in the morning and somebody's dead, and then maybe their mothers or their wives had to deal with that situation, and you had to be there to watch it. You know, somebody that you were speaking with, like the first guy that died, was right opposite me. And we had said hello a couple of times, you know, like, you know, when you're trying to do exercises, like, oh, yeah, what's up when the guy dies? And his mother would have been there the whole time, you know, trying to make sure that he was well, trying to get the oxygen and get him to do everything. She was just, he was there, his brother was just making out of her. And I just sat there and it was just, uh, the reality just hit you that just, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. I think that when you, when you flex with a near-death experience, it, it changes how you see life. Basically, you, you value you value life, you value um, you know integrity, happiness, sunlight, little things. I mean, I was in hospital and I saw eight people die in my ward, and that really just changed my perspective of my life. Um, so it was tough. It was it was tough mentally for me, just being in that position and then. I realized that health is, is, is very key and, and it's not something you should take for granted at all. How, how was it um, being in that mental state and still having to cope with the lockdown? Give me a lot of time to think.
So I have a lot of guilt from the way my mom died. Because I was responsible for her. She was in my care. So it gave me a lot of time to think, to process my own guilt. Um, And I think it helped to cope because the guilt is still there, but there was something I saw yesterday where someone said moving on isn't healing, but it's better than staying in one place. So it gave me a lot of time to think through my feelings, process my feelings and pick myself up because I couldn't stay there. So we were there, he was about until August. So my son was about three months when we were trying to get back to Nigeria. He's a big boy. Oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention I didn't, apart from the first checkup, post-pregnancy, he only went for one because he didn't go to the hospitals. So you just wonder what everything was, what exactly, if anything is going wrong, we don't know. When I was pregnant, same thing. I went for two um, antenatals and then hoped for the best. Just shake my body. I'm like, I feel okay. I guess I'm okay. Yeah, and then I gave birth suddenly. So maybe my body was giving signs before, maybe it wasn't. Nobody knows. Uh, but we made it um, to the airport. So getting the flights, um, it wasn't easy. That one was another big drama, but whatever. Wonderful thing that Nigeria did for us. The evacuation flight was um, going to stop in two, two locations, Lagos and then Abuja. So, oh no, it was Abuja then Lagos, yeah, I think. Mm. So when we landed in Nigeria, people came down from the plane and then people entered the plane like a bus, <laughs> like a bus. I was like, this is, are we not in the pandemic? Why are you mixing people up? We don't even know where these people are from. Well, people entered the plane and we flew ourselves to Lagos. And I was just over it at that point. I was just like, let me just get home. The airport was so rowdy. And <laughs> myself that I have not been in close contact with people in, in months and months. So everybody was next to each other. Nigerians were shouting. I was like, this is... <laughs> um, but it still felt good. Honestly, to see people being people again, it felt good. I remember um, I had COVID twice. And um, the first thing that made me realize before having the COVID test done and then it came out the way it was, was that I had lost my sense of smell. I just couldn't smell anything. And I think when I put out the tweet about the loss of sense of smell, a, it, it gathered a lot of attention because a lot of people were having similar symptoms at the same time. But many of them went diagnosed as malaria. I ran a malaria test at that time, it came out positive. I treated the malaria, but my sense of smell didn't come back. And then I later realized that, you know, by the time I made a little bit of more research on my own, I discovered that COVID had evolved to include loss of sense of smell as part of the symptoms of COVID. So um, a lot of people tended to just look at it, I'm having malaria because I'm having weakness, fatigue, and this kind of headache. I assume that I have malaria, and they start taking um, anti-malaria drugs, not knowing fully well that they're having COVID, and they still go out maybe meeting their neighbors, talking with them, and all of that, and they're spreading you know, the, this um, virus to other people, unsuspecting people, and so it, it was just a whole vicious cycle of people not knowing what exactly they are dealing with 
and then going, um, you know, and, and taking drugs for the wrong reasons. And it, honestly, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy time. The first thing that we were scared of was uh, getting COVID because most of the time we actually go out to go and get yes, uh, groceries from supermarket. And we're extra careful when we get back, we'll, we'll take our sanitizer, we'll Wipe rub it. All, every item that we buy, the ones that are waterproof, we we'll wash them with soap and water. So it was crazy because in my mind, if I get, it's easy for her to get it because we are partners. So that was one of the things I was scared, scared of. of. Aside that, I don't think there was any other thing that was scared of. Mm. Nah. nah, nothing. <laughs> Maybe getting pregnant that period because we still wanted to do some um, couple <laughs> goals before. We still wanted to have fun. <laughs> you know, still do some couple goals before, you know, having kids. So I think that period there, eh, I was scared of getting pregnant. I won't lie. <laughs> <laughs> what time is she trying to cope? <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Started with joy, started with, you know, getting closer to God, <laughs> having to pray every morning too. And then, for me, the most important one that year was the fact that I got enough time to spend with my children. You know, they were all at home. We, we just wake up in the morning, pray, play games. And luckily in the estate, we were able to go around the field and just generally get to know each other more. It was an experience that I don't think we'll come back again, but I really cherish that period, being with the children in the house, getting to learn each and everybody's um, uh, way of relating with their siblings together in that kind of situation. A situation that we did not know what was going to happen. Uh, we were hearing about people's deaths. It was scary. And then at the same time, you know, it was joyful because you were with your family and then you were hoping that someday there will be a solution to all of this. So it was, a, it was a mixed feeling. So many things were happening. We were learning. We had this opportunity of going online to find out what was going on in the world. You know, that period, people came out with the issue of 5G and technology being the one that was, you know, causing the corona. There just really wasn't enough truth as like everything else, nobody is able to know exactly what is happening until the thing itself plays itself out. So that year, I tell you, I, I, I learned quite a lot of things, but we're glad we're here. Mind you, we're still not out of it because like I said, I'm still working from home up till now. So I'm still learning quite a lot of things. This is something that um, technology has helped us to transition from the office to working from anywhere. And this is what, you know, developed countries have been doing for quite a while. In work, in school, in so many things they do in life, they simply just use um, technology to make it easier. Either Zoom or Teams meeting or, you mentioned it, people are able. In fact, on YouTube, on um, WhatsApp now, you can do conference calls, you can do so many things that we did not know we could do before. So it's a great advantage to almost all of us. Unfortunately, the people that lost their lives, we pray for the rest in peace of their souls. Uh, on an average, I go to the market once, twice a week. This is the general market where I buy perishables. And perishables, the things that can't go into the freezer, that go into the fridge, they usually last a couple of days because I try to keep things as fresh as possible. And it is so weird that at the beginning of the lockdown, there was some sort of enforcement. You'd see some eologers, babaologers, all those types of people coming about in the market saying, eh, you're not wearing your mask, you're not wearing your mask, we won't allow you, you know, set up your stall, all of those things. But now, 2021, where a lot of people are relaxed, in fact, a lot of people are so relaxed that they have the school of thought that COVID was a hoax to begin with. I went to the market, I did a quick market run before this, you know, interview. And as weird as it seems, I'm super observant about my surroundings. I was the only person 
in the market today that wore a face mask. Whether it was a seller or someone who came to the market to buy something. And at every point that happens, people look at me strangely. Even the people that I buy from every week. They will just say, ah, Oga, you have come. And I'm speaking. And I try to be audible because I do understand that sound can be muffled. And you see some people deliberately acting like they're straining to hear me in the hopes that I would take off my mask or something I do not know. But I, most of the time I do not. If I do on very rare occasions and it has to be absolutely necessary. So it's weird how people look at me like, ah, talele, oh, a mask. Meaning, ah, who is this one? He's wearing a mask. Why, you know, in this day and age. When I step back into the car, I'm sanitizing my hands quickly. And people just look at me weird. And that just goes to show you how lax the general society is. The average Nigerian, the everyday person who is going to the market or who is going to like their job or whatever. It just goes to show how lax people are. So, um, yeah. Um, it, it's the reason why I said, you know, uh, COVID-19 COVID protocols were instituted and, you know, there was a lot of response, but the response was not sustained. And, you know, Nigerians, coconutted, you know, we are, we are very set in our ways. And um, if Nigerians want desperately to go back to their normal way of life, and ideally, we should have. The lockdown was not necessarily the way to go. I personally believed that if we had strict protocols to social distancing and identifying, you know, when somebody has symptoms that were COVID-like, we would have been able to move forward and not have the severe economic setback that we actually went through. But presently as it is, everybody has already gone lax about it because some people have collected the vaccine, so they feel that, oh, I will not have it again. And really, that's not how COVID works. Even if you've taken the vaccine, you definitely still have to maintain some sort of decorum. And um, the, what the vaccine does is to enable you not to fall severely ill as a result of COVID. That's actually what, that's, that's, that's what the vaccine does. It helps your immune system, you know, spot, up, uh, spot COVID on time and then suppress it. So um, generally for me, I believe that we've gone back to our ways uh, because we are Nigerians and people want to desperately go back to their way of life. But I think um, to prevent what happened last year, we need to be wise enough and do the necessary things like get vaccinated if you can. If you are within the safe range for vaccination, you should get vaccinated. If you are somebody who is going to be exposed going out, you are, you are, you are meeting with people, you definitely need to, um, to be vaccinated. I guess in Nigeria, people just didn't really consider COVID to be something that was real. Um, then I started really trying to understand why. And many people just felt like the government was using it to steal money. And a lot of people still feel that way. Some people who didn't feel that way feel that way now. Some parts of me wonders what exactly, what everything is about, but I know what happened in New York. I know how it was. And America is, you know, tagged as the land of the free and they wouldn't have they wouldn't have gone through all that if it wasn't real and scary. It definitely is corona and everyone has to stay, you know, do their best to stay away from the virus. Um, you know, get vaccinated. Uh, uh, if you wish, because of course it should be your choice as well. I, I do de definitely believe that. Also, you know, make sure you're wearing your masks at, at all time to protect yourself and other people. And yeah, just stay safe, man. Corona is real. Yeah, it is real. People that say they don't believe in COVID are really, I don't want to say that, I mean, they're ignorant. There's no, there's no way to say it, so, so nicely put it. They're just ignorant. And I feel they should educate themselves uh, about this disease. Um, COVID attacks your vital organs, your lungs, and everything. And it has killed a lot of people. And I hope they don't get COVID. I hope they don't get COVID. But it is 
it's a risk for people not to be vaccinated because you are selfish for putting everybody else at risk, including yourself and your family, and even some innocent bypasses that probably just go about their business for putting them at risk. So for me, I think that the, if you're a kind person, you should care about other people as well. My advice out there, COVID is real, because I lost someone to COVID actually, so yeah. COVID is real, like it's real. At first I thought it wasn't it was just a mess story to make Nigerians stay indoors, but COVID is actually real. I lost my aunt's husband to COVID and we thought it was normal malaria then. The whole testing came up and found out that he actually died of COVID. It was a sad experience. So please and please, COVID is real. Stay safe, face masks on, sanitizers with you everywhere you go and please avoid crowded spaces, I would say. You don't, you know they say people learn from experience? Experience hurts, man. You don't need experience to learn stuff. Like experience sucks. You can, Decide to use your brain. <laughs> I mean, activate your brain cells, man. It's just try not to mess with this. It's not. I know that I love theories like conspiracy theories and all of that, but this stuff is it's happening and it's how it came to be is not more important than the fact that it's. It's happening. It's here. People are dying. Even getting ill is... <laughs> it's quite the... It's quite the experience. The exhaustion is like no other. The fatigue is like no other. Not talk of the whatever side effects, whatever COVID has done in your body that you're not even... Sure, if you don't even know yet, don't wait to get it to believe it. Don't wait to experience it to believe it. It's use your brain, man. That's it. Use your brain. So one of the ways that we ensure that I ensure safety protocols is. Uh, to make sure that I have the necessary things that are available, um, san hand sanitizers in my own personal house. The minute you come into my door, we have a rule. You go to the bathroom downstairs, you wash your hands, you use the hand sanitizer, you have to come in with your mask. Standard, standard protocol. Um, because obviously I don't have a testing kit in my house. I can't test everybody and I don't know where you're from. Um, we try as much as possible to, I mean, we don't self-distance in my house. I mean, because most of us at home are, are half vaccinated. So, but if someone else comes from outside and whatnot, I mean, uh, you either have your mask or you disinfect yourself. At work, I'm not shooting currently, but again, if I was shooting currently, I think one of the, there was a, there's a project that we're about to do. And one of the things I wanted to do, in fact, me and uh, the line producer were discussing about it at some time. I think she proposed that, oh, if we want to get people, let's be people that have been vaccinated. I say, well, it's not that, I don't know, Drigget, but the other thing we wanted to do is obviously you must make sure those protocols are in place, which is, when you come to set, there's a point where you wash your hands, you, there's a body temp temperature thing, there's a hand sanitizer, there's a first aid box around the corner, and just, you know, we try to enforce, you know, general hygiene. And look, you, in fact, when we did our last project, there was a, um, we had like a, I don't, it's not like, a, I don't know what they call it, it's like a, an onboarding. These are the things you need to do. It was even in our rules and regulations and whatnot. You need to disinfect yourself, come with your own hand sanitizers, and just make sure that you're taking care of your own self just in case, you know, yeah, so that's it. Hand sanitizer and we, mask. We, uh, we have plenty of masks <laughs> here. Mask. Hand wash, plenty. But the bathroom is right beside the door, the guest toilet. So once you come in, you can just turn to the left and wash your hands, but yeah. yeah. Although there's only one person I know that does that consciously, she mm. <laughs> your cousin. Yeah. Apart from Every that. time she comes here, she goes to wash her hands first. Immediately. Um, apart from that, what does they use to protect COVID? Mask, <laughs> hand wash, sanitizer. Vitamin C. 
No, let's not lie. Let's not, let's not lie on camera. Ah, but you were using hot water. Maybe for like three days. <laughs> um, and God is here. Just okay. anywhere you turn, you will just see God. <laughs> I promise. If there was another lockdown, I would obviously, like, definitely be looking forward to it because now I'm better experienced and I know what to, you know, what to do and what not to do. And I feel like I can handle it better than I did the first one. So I don't think lockdown scares me anymore, being locked up with this man here, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like being locked up. Locked up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes.